Since I was born, I have a great passion for all animal life, and aquatic life in particular. I love to spend time face down in the water, exploring this mysterious part of the world. And I would like to preserve the biologically rich ecosystems of our world's oceans. Unfortunately, many of these ecosystems are threatened by fisheries. The rate of marine species decline is higher than ever. Most of the world's fish stocks are either maximally exploited, overexploited, or even have collapsed. That is why I kindly ask you to please stop eating fish. That is probably a bit of a naive request. I don't expect you to give up a nutritious, healthy, and admittedly fine tasting part of your diet. Nor do I expect the world's poor to give up uh, an important source of dietary protein. So if we cannot or are not willing to change the demand for fish, we need to change its supply. And to achieve that, we can learn from livestock production. Up to some 10,000 years ago, men used to hunt for meat. But as of the onset of farming, men changed the genetics of wild animals. Jungle fowls were changed into chicken, wild boar into pigs, and aurochs into cows. And these farmed animals were more productive and more efficient than their wild ancestors. And thereby farming quickly removed men's dependency of hunting. If we would still rely on hunting for animal protein, we might not only have driven aurochs to extinction, but perhaps also jungle fowls, wild boar, and many more species. It's obvious that the only way to meet the current demand for animal protein is by farming animals that are genetically superior to their wild ancestors. Global fish production, in contrast, heavily relies on wild animals. Most of the world's, of about half of the global fish production originates from fisheries, which is the underwater equivalent of hunting. And the other half originates from aquaculture. Aquaculture is the farming of fish. In cages or ponds, the fish are fed until they reach a um, harvest size. The fish used in aquaculture are often genetically similar to the wild counterpart, meaning that these animals are optimally adapted to the wild, but not to farming conditions. And this is clearly a missed opportunity for sustainable fish production. To make aquaculture a better alternative to fisheries, we need to make the fish used in aquaculture more productive and more efficient. And to achieve that, we could use a very controversial um, method, which would be genetic modification. And maybe that would work. But genetic modification is the tinkering with the DNA. But luckily, a uh, well-tested, very effective, and widely accepted alternative is readily available. We can use the same tool set as has been used in livestock for decades. Selective breeding. Selective breeding uses genetic variation that is naturally present in any population. Selective breeding is the process that, together with domestication, has transformed jungle fowls into chicken, wild boar into pigs, and aurochs into cows. By selecting animals for a particular set of traits we find desirable, we can change the genetics of a species. And that is explained by heritable variation. Many traits vary among individuals. For example, human height. I need the next slide here, by the way. <laughs> and part of that variation is heritable, meaning that it's transferred from parents to their children via their DNA. This means that if I would select from this room the tallest men and women and let them have children, their children, or probably our children, are likely to become taller than average because they inherit genes for being tall from their parents. And repeating that process, generation after generation, leads to increasingly tall people. 
that of selective breeding. And it's exactly this process that has increased both productivity and efficiency of livestock a lot. For example, a laying hen in 1960 produced 230 eggs, while today a laying hen produces 430 eggs. And this increase in productivity is largely due to genetic improvement by selective breeding. But not only has a laying hen become more productive, it's also more efficient. While in 1960 a laying hen produced about 5 eggs per kilogram feed, today it produces almost 10 eggs per kilogram feed. And this is a major step towards sustainable production, because less feed use means less land use for feed production and less pollution. But good examples of what selective breeding can do are not restricted to the land. Also in aquaculture, selective breeding can be and has been very successful. For example, Atlantic salmon has been selected for about 10 generations since the early 1970s. And the growth performance of currently farmed salmon is about three times as fast as the growth of its wild counterpart in the same conditions. In addition, it uses 20% less feed per kilogram production. Tilapia is one of the major farm species worldwide. It's a species on the left, better known as the fillet on the right. And the time period for tilapia to reach market size can be halved when a selected strain is used instead of an unselected strain. Unfortunately, farmers are often unaware of the benefits of genetic improvement and rely on genetically poor performing strains. The enormous potential of selective breeding in agriculture is what inspired me to start my current PhD research at Wageningen University. In my research, I perform an economic optimization of breeding programs in European agriculture. And amongst others, I try to find the optimum balance in the improvement of traits. For example, improvement of productivity versus improvement of efficiency. But next to research, our team is also involved in the implementation of breeding programs worldwide. And a nice example of that is this project I visited last September in Indonesia. In this project, we provide training and support to local breeding programs. And in one of these breeding programs, the growth performance of catfish has already increased by 60%, which comes to the benefit of the local community. Now, let us take us one step back. And if we look at our globe, we see that 70% of its surface is covered in water. And however vast oceans may seem, wild fish resources are far from infinite. If we want to relieve the pressure from wild fish stocks and preserve the diversity and richness of our world's oceans, we need aquaculture to become more productive and more efficient. Selective breeding can contribute to that. We can learn from both the achievements and pitfalls of selective breeding in livestock, and it's my hope that these lessons will be used to tr transform aquaculture into a better alternative to fisheries. And we will soon move away from farming underwater versions of jungle fowls, wild boar and artworks, and instead adopt selective breeding in aquaculture. Thank you. <laughs>